Good evening and welcome to the November 20th regular town council meeting. If Councillor Spinella could lead us in the prayer, uh, prayer of the pledge, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Dolores, will you take attendance? Councillor Breton. Here. Councillor Forrest. Here. Councillor Hurley. Here. Councillor Latina. Here. Councillor Lesser. Here. Councillor Rell. Here. Councillor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor Martino. Here. And Mayor Warren Bello. Here. Thank you. We'll start tonight with a presentation by the Central Connecticut Health District. Good evening and welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, and thank you for having us this evening. We are glad to be here and to, to again bring you up to date on what's going on in our health district and the town. Um, I'm Judy Sartucci. I'm a representative from the town of Rocky Hill on the Board of Health, and I also served for the last few years as its chairman of the board. Uh, with us this evening are, is Charles Brown, who will be doing the bulk of our presentation. <coughs> also, I want to take this opportunity to introduce two of your three representatives that you've appointed to three-year terms on our Board of Health. We have um, over <laughs> to my right here uh, is Deborah Hanault from uh, Weathersfield and also Anne-Marie De Loretto from Weathersfield. Um, he, uh, not with us this evening is John Aferismo. He sends his apologies. He has a, a business engagement uh, that wasn't able to join us this evening. Um, bef uh, okay, go ahead. Um, we want to give. I want to give you a little bit of background about the uh, Central Connecticut Health District and its history and what we're currently doing on the board. And uh, then I'd like uh, to have Charlie will be uh, taking over the bulk of the rest of the presentation. Um, the health district um, is actually in its 20 going into its 20. It's in its 21st year, going into its 22nd year of service to um, the four towns of Berlin, Newington, Rocky Hill, and Wethersfield. It was formed back in 1996 by the towns of Rocky Hill and Wethersfield. Uh, Berlin uh, uh, applied for and was admitted um, in 1998, not too long after the original health district was formed. And then in 2006, the town of uh, Newington requested and applied and uh, was admitted to the health district. So we currently serve a population just under 98,000. We're a regional health department. Uh, in, uh, instead of each town having its own health department, we have a regional agency. Uh, we're one of 20 in the state, and this gives you the, an idea of the hodgepodge. Of, uh, of health districts across the state. Uh, they number anywhere from uh, two towns or cities to 18 um, uh, municipalities, including three boroughs up in Litchfield County. So they're, they're quite varied. Um, we're very fortunate here in that our four town member towns are very homogenous, both in terms of the towns and um, their governance and uh, a lot of the approaches uh, that are needed for public health, though we do have a number of problems that Charles will, uh, will be addressing. Um, we have a full governing board, which means that the people that you appoint to the health district serve for three years on a rotating basis. Um, as a full governing board, we're responsible for assessing the needs of the health district, all the four towns, and then some subpopulations within there. 
determining the overall direction for the health district and the services provided. And we're very pleased that we've moved more and more toward becoming a full service health department. Uh, we're responsible as a board for developing agency and public health policy, um, establishing and enforcing through our director and his staff uh, the public health regulations, including local ordinances related to public health. Uh, we also have our own public health code locally as well that Charles is responsible for enforcing. We oversee the district's budget and financial affairs, uh, as well as employing our director of health as our chief executive officer for a three-year term. We're pleased to say that the board did reappoint Charlie for um, another three-year term this past September. Okay, and okay so Charlie will go ahead now and just uh, give you a bit more regarding uh, our fiscal situation as well as our programs and we'll be glad to answer questions okay. thank you Jenny. Um, so first thing to start off with is the money as always uh, it's always the bottom line so in 2016 2017 our total revenues uh, were just about uh, one million one hundred thousand and one hundred eight thousand uh, the bulk of our um, of our revenue really does come from town contributions you see about five hundred thirteen thousand at five dollars and twenty five cents per capita so uh, for each one in the audience we got five dollars and twenty five cents in 1617 for each one of you to do a year's worth of public health um, in addition to that we also have program revenue from things like the flu vaccinations that we give and other services that we provide uh, we also receive federal state and other grants uh, that total about three hundred thousand dollars in revenue and then we do get some interest income off of you know some of the reserve monies that we hold uh, in that rainy day fund our expenditures for 1617 uh, ended up with one million one hundred eighty six thousand three hundred fourteen uh, as you can tell we're a service agency uh, so most of our expenditures really do come from the people that actually provide that service uh, so our employee salaries their benefits uh, also professional contracts and things of that nature uh, we do have expenses from our program and operating expenses overhead uh, and also just other expenses to the tune of about like i said one million one hundred eighty six thousand dollars now on the surface those of you who are doing quick math it looks like we had a losing that we lost revenue last year um, but there was a caveat to that uh, we actually ended up having to pay out um, a settlement for one of our, our health this our health director our previous health director to the tune of about ninety thousand um, dollars <coughs> that actually if you take that away which we had been actually saving money the health district and the board have been putting money away towards that for some time uh, so if you take that away we actually came out about thirteen thousand dollars in the black um, so it's not as bad as it looks on the surface so for some of you um, Talking about the difference between health care and public health um, may be different. When people hear health, they think white lab coats, they think stethoscopes. And that's not necessarily what public health is really all about. Um, so we'll take a little bit of an approach that it's similar and different. So healthcare, when they look at um, somebody, they're looking at their primary focus being the individual, where public health looks at the population as a whole. Uh, there are patient. Uh, the interventions for healthcare really looks like diagnosis and treatment. They look at the individual, tell me what's wrong, and I'll give you what you need to be able to treat that particular ailment. Public health uses things like assessment, policy development, and assurance as our intervention. So as we assess the population, we actually look at developing policies to address the issues that we are concerned, and then we assure that those policies are, are carried out. Uh, process in healthcare really looks like management of individual patient care. Where in public health, we think more about systems management, you know, looking at the environment, how we can affect human behavior. Uh, the outcome at the end of a healthcare scenario is returning that individual to health. In public health, we really look at how we can ensure that the community stays healthy over the long term. So I uh, use influenza. Something that happens every year is kind of an example of this. So, healthcare response you screen an individual for risk, you teach them to prevent, you give them an annual flu shot, you provide Tamiflu and other medications when they become infected, 
<clears throat> and then you treat any related conditions like pneumonia that may be secondary to a flu infection. And then you report that disease to the state health department. Where public health's response is a little different, but similar in some scopes. Uh, we have public information campaigns. Uh, we monitor and track the seasonal occurrence of flu. We have targeted or mass vaccination clinics trying to make sure that enough people within the community have herd immunity so that those flu viruses really can't catch hold. And then we promote policies such as employer required vaccination for healthcare workers uh, so that people that are treating those who are ill aren't actually causing more problems than they're solving. So what is the purpose of a public health agency? Uh, well, as you can see in the cartoon, you can't walk to the drugstore and say, I'll have an ounce of prevention. Uh, so we're really here to prevent epidemics uh, and the spread of disease, to protect against environmental hazards, preventing injuries, uh, promoting and encouraging healthy behaviors, responding to disasters and assisting the communities as they recover from those disasters, and to assure the quality and accessibility of health services. So let's give some examples of these as we go through our past year. So for preventing epidemics and spread of disease, our health district actually provides mass vaccination clinics in all four of our towns. Uh, this past year we've had, let's see, about nine so far uh, of health uh, flu clinics, and I know some of you are very familiar with those. Tony. <laughs> uh, we give over 2,000 flu shots every year. Uh, and we actually do it pretty good because we use this as a drill for our mass vaccination clinic. So if we had to respond to pandemic influenza or something that required vaccinations, we have nurses and staff and volunteers that are actually trained to be able to do this. And it's a benefit to the people that actually come to us because the average time, if you have a pre-filled uh, form, is about three minutes from door to door. So we can give shots faster than a pharmacy ever thought of doing. Um, we also provide a lot of disease follow-up. We receive lab reports on all the diseases for the towns that are reportable to public health, and we actually follow up on things. Uh, we've had particular focus over the past couple years on the hepatitis C uh, epidemic that we're seeing, and a lot of that ties into the opioid epidemic. Uh, another thing that comes up when we're talking about preventing the spread of disease is always those mosquito-borne diseases. Uh, every year we hear about West Nile virus uh, as the testing sites actually find mosquitoes that are infected with West Nile virus and then we also follow up to see if there's actually um, people that are actually have, have contracted West Nile virus. Uh, the big focus last year uh, was on Zika. Uh, <coughs> unfortunately for us, the type of mosquito that actually carries Zika uh, really doesn't live in our area of the state. There are some pockets down in Fairfield County that have that particular type of mosquito, but here in the central part of the, of the state, we really don't have that particular type of um, mosquito that carries the virus. That doesn't mean that our um, people aren't affected by Zika. Uh, we actually do have people that travel, go to places where Zika is endemic, and they may actually come back here, um, you know, into our towns. And we actually work with the State Department of Public Health to help follow up, make sure that they have the information and are getting the clinical services that they need to address those issues. Uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, or triple E, is another thing that we actually watch out for that is a mosquito-borne disease. Protecting against environmental hazards, our environmental health sanitarians do a lot of inspections. And this is the foundation for what a public health agency really does. Uh, we regulate um, food service, septic, pools, salons, and we've done about just over almost 1,900 inspections last year to ensure that they're maintaining and meeting the standards of the regulation. In addition to that, we also help train food service operators uh, to ensure that their people are handling food correctly, uh, making sure that they're doing the right things when we're not there to see them because they're operating a lot more often on their own than we're ever in there to be able to provide oversight. So we have to ensure that the qualified food operators in each one of those uh, establishments really knows what they're doing and we can assure that the food that's coming out is gonna be safe. 
Another issue that we've dealt with in environmental hazards, uh, we've responded to 221 complaints uh, in 1617 uh, related to health and safety. Uh, as you can see, hoarding is an issue and is a public health issue as well. Uh, we respond to issues like that when they have public health significance. Um, and we also help to work with the state's attorney's office to address those complex issues related to housing and public health. Other environmental hazards, uh, we've done a lot of work in 1617 in lead poisoning prevention. Uh, had outreach to folks that lived in rental housing uh, that was pre-1978. Uh, so we've done a lot of outreach to make sure that people are aware of the potential hazards of lead. But it's not just peeling paint uh, where people have found lead and been exposed to lead or children have been poisoned. Uh, we see things like uh, pressure cookers that we've actually tested because we've had to do investigations that had high concentrations of lead in the relief valves. Um, so we've ha actually had to follow that up. We work with the families. We um, educate them on how to reduce those levels of lead and exposure possibilities. Uh, radon every year is an issue. Radon is a naturally occurring element, uh, but we do have the opportunity to, to test for it and mitigate it if you can find it. Uh, so we actually have test kits for radon in all of our offices. Uh, we distribute them every year so that people can test their own houses so that they can take, it, you know, take the opportunity to address those issues if they're found. Another major environmental hazard uh, that we work on is asthma education. We have uh, what they call the putting on airs program. And this is where we're trying to really prevent emergency room visits that are related to asthma. So what we do is we have a team approach uh, that pairs an asthma health educator with an environmental sanitarian that goes into a family's home when they request it. And we actually work with them to educate them, to do an assessment of their property, uh, to really try to limit those triggers so that the patients and children especially uh, can really manage their asthma appropriately. We also do training on the proper use of medication so that people understand what they've been given because a lot of times people will go into an emergency room because they're having a reaction and they may get several different medications and they're not sure really which to use and when. Uh, so our asthma educators have an opportunity to do training uh, to help them manage effectively. Preventing injuries is another major thing that we do. Uh, we actually sell bike helmets. Uh, so, you know, we're a little bit past the riding bike stage, but we're, you know, as far as the coolness out there, but I still see a lot of kids riding bikes to school, which is great. Um, so if you're looking for a really good Christmas present for those who are younger, who maybe are looking maybe sleds as well, uh, helmet's a great gift. Uh, we sell them in, all, in our health district right downstairs. 10 bucks a pop, you can't beat it. Another thing we're doing to prevent injuries is really trying to spread the message through social media. So we have a Facebook page. Uh, we try to actually get information out there so that people are aware of the, of the risk of injury around them. We also promote and encourage healthy behaviors. Uh, let's see, for several years we've had a walking competition that was really related to the governmental employees within our four towns. Uh, since the last two years, we've actually opened that up to the general public. Uh, so we, this walking competition is among our four towns. And overall, so far, Berlin's actually won the competition both times. But you will notice a familiar face there at the bottom. Uh, Weathersfield uh, actually last year won the newly, uh, we enacted an impact award. Uh, I'm very proud of Weathersfield, I really am, because they actually more than doubled the amount of participants that they saw between the first year that the public was involved and the second year. And that's absolutely what we want to see. We want to see more people in the communities out there walking because it's one of the best things that you can do and the easiest things that you can do to really improve your health and the health of your community. And Weathersfield has a great infrastructure uh, to really support that. So I encourage you all to use it. And coming up here in April when we have our third competition, uh, get out there and walk and really give Berlin a run for their money, okay? In addition, we also promote, as far as promoting and encouraging behavior, healthy behaviors, uh, we have our Living Healthy in the District Guide. Uh, this guide, which I've got several copies up here, uh, really provides a plethora of information uh, concerning things like mental health and substance abuse resources, 
uh, food resources in the district, uh, community supported agriculture, trails and parks, and opportunities around emergency preparedness, and a, and a short description of our public health programs. Uh, please take advantage of this. Grab one of these because there's a wealth of information in there. In addition to that, uh, last year actually we did some training sessions around holiday food safety. Uh, Everybody is getting ready to gather for Thanksgiving. How you actually handle your food, how you actually, you know, pack it up for the leftovers to make sure that you're not giving the gift that somebody really doesn't want, uh, and that would be food poisoning or something along those lines. Uh, so we did actual training last year. We'll probably do it again next year uh, just to make sure that people are aware of those types of things. But those are the types of programs that we're really looking to increase as we go forward. Um, I mentioned before emergency preparedness and flu clinics. Well, the flu clinics do provide us a good opportunity to drill our medical countermeasure dispensing. So we have the responsibility if there was a pandemic or God forbid, a bioterrorist attack, to really get those countermeasures uh, out there to all the public. Uh, so we actually have plans that are established for that and we test those plans and we use our flu clinics as an opportunity to, to do so. As far as assuring the quality and accessibility of health services, uh, we actually provide dental screenings to seniors in all four of our towns. Um, last year, uh, we actually served about 88 clients and these were free or, uh, oral health screenings. Uh, for seniors. So if they're in need, we actually do that. We've actually worked with our senior centers in our four towns, and this has been a very, very good program. People don't take into account uh, how much oral health uh, really contributes to the overall health, especially as we get older. As I mentioned earlier, one of the main crises that we're working with right now is the crisis uh, responding to the opioid crisis itself. Um, so we've been asked as we've come before the town councils, really, what is the health district doing with respect to the opioid crisis? Um, so we've been to a number of the public awareness forums uh, that people that each one of the towns have had. And what we've actually heard is it's a great opportunity to bring people together, bring awareness out there about what is going on. But the challenge is the action isn't there. People hear about what's going on and then there's very little follow up that comes from that. So we at the health district said, well, let's bring our four towns together and let's focus on what actions we can do by working together and bringing resources together to be able to address this crisis. So we've held two stakeholder forums back in April and here on November 2nd. And we currently have work groups that are addressing the prevention, response, treatment, and recovery uh, to opioid overdose. Um, so we've been very successful in keeping people engaged on this and they've actually been focusing a lot on things like drug take back and establishing programs to be able to do outreach into the schools so that we can really focus on the prevention mission that public health is so, so good at. Going forward, we are looking and have looked for several years at the consolidation of our office staffs and functions into one site. And we're really targeting late 2018 uh, to be able to make that actually happen. Um, in addition to that, administration and health policies, uh, we are actually going through the process of revising our health district code, uh, which is a sanitary code as a whole. Uh, and we've been working with our super supervising sanitarian and members of our board to be able to come up with that. One of the major things that's gonna be happening here in the coming year is the adoption of the new FDA food code. So the state health department, the state legislature uh, used to have their own, Connecticut had their own specific food code. Well, they decided to adopt the national FDA code and that's gonna make some serious changes on how the regulatory over food service happens in the coming year. There's been some changes already where temperature requirements have changed a little bit here in October, but the focus of the inspections is going to change drastically. It's going to be much less on are the walls clean or the halls intact and much more focused on do the individuals know how to handle food properly? Uh, do they know what they're doing? Do they understand uh, how to address risk within the processes that they have? Um, in addition to that, we're also continuing to work on preparing for national public health accreditation and hopefully we'll be able to uh, be prepared to put in an application here in the next couple years. 
With that, my last word, especially in this week, is thanks. Thank you to all of our member towns, to you, our public, and for your continued support of the health district and our operations. And I stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Charles and Judith, for the presentation. Are there any questions? Any councilor questions? Any? Thank you, Mayor. It's good to see you, Charlie. <coughs> And I appreciate all the work that you do and the board does and partnering with us with the Hunger Action Team. Uh, thank you. My particular question is around childhood obesity, which is a growing problem throughout the country, throughout Connecticut and right here in Wethersfield. And just wanted you to comment a little bit of what types of things you might be doing to encourage healthier eating and particularly with, with childhood obesity on the rise. Well, one of the main things that we've been doing is encouraging active living. So the walking competition and those types of things really comes hand in hand with the healthy eating um, initiative. Uh, one of the main things that we've done last year was work with the State Health Improvement Planning Council uh, on developing a healthy donation list. And that was just rolled out here in time for the Thanksgiving drives. Um, so we've really tried to put emphasis on as people are donating things, to donate the right types of things. That not to give people something that's going to cause them problems, you know, further down the line. Uh, additionally, we're really looking forward to working much more closely with the school systems. Uh, this year, I think Weathersfield re kind of vitalized their wellness committee. And Ann Hartman, my assistant director for community health, actually sits on that committee now. Uh, so we're looking forward to being able to work with them much more closely uh, to be able to address those issues. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I do. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, on the consolidation of offices, yes. Um, I think last time it got brought up last year. Yeah. Is it still going to cost us more to consolidate than to have the separate offices? Well, what what we're looking at right now is trying to be able to do this as cost effectively as possible. As I'd mentioned. One of the main issues that we're looking at in the coming year is the FDA food code integration. Um, and if we don't consolidate our offices and actually be able to work our people much more efficiently, it's really going to cost us more because we're going to need more personnel resources to be able to handle the workload that we're anticipating. So I'm hoping that the offset of actually consolidating our offices versus having to hire more people that I don't have space for to can do the work that we're required. Um, our goal is really to make this uh, as painless as possible to the towns as a whole. So we're looking at cost savings in a number of areas uh, to be able to make sure that, you know, where things are appropriate, that the towns are actually paying for those things. But we're looking at being able to do this as efficiently as we can. Okay, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Charlie. Uh, my question is the, the $90,000 for the health district director, was it? Yeah, it was a settlement um, as part of his uh, separation from the, and retirement from the health district that dealt with his health care costs. Mm -hmm. um, so they did reach a settlement with um, with the previous director, and that ninety thousand dollars was a, was a portion of the payment, the majority of the payment for that settlement. Okay, and I know it's been going on for a number of years, mm -hmm. and there's been back and forth on health care or you know benefits. Is that behind us now? Yes, we've, we've got, we have one more payment on that settlement, but that should be paid out in January, and then that portion of will be complete for the health district. Are you at liberty to say how much that second payment would be? Mm. Yeah, so. Um, it's, it, I, I think it's about $50,000, okay. to be honest. Um, it's a right around that piece. And that would be? And that would the be the final complete. chapter in this it would be. i know you guys want to get it behind you i'm i'm sure but yeah um, it has um, been going as i've said um as the board really did kind of plan for this because they mm -hmm. knew that it was a payment that was coming forward so they'd been putting money away towards that and those savings you know because we have been putting that money away hopefully we'll be able to turn those into being able to address some of the other issues that Great. we're dealing with okay thank you any other questions? Council Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Nice job, Charlie. Thanks. Um, can you turn to page four of your slides? Let me get back to where it is. There you go. 
There. No, one. You passed it once, I think. One, uh, that way. I have number slide four on my thing here. One, two, three. It it's the map of the state of Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. There yeah, it is. There. So uh, I was looking at this map, and you know, we're always like the next few slides, of course, were budgetary and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the odd one out seems to be Cromwell. Mm -hmm. uh, small town, looks like it's a full-time municipal local health district, so they're doing it all themselves and we're this con consolidated effort. And has there been outreach to them to help increase your budget and provide efficiencies throughout the cent central Connecticut? Uh, we have talked in the past with Cromwell as far as that's concerned. Nothing official. You want to jump in, Judy, because she's got the institutional knowledge yeah. on this. Um, it's been a few years, and, and maybe uh, and Jeff Bridges may have some uh, more first, first hand knowledge of this. But the former first selectman of Cromwell used to meet with the mayors and managers group, and uh, there had been some kind of off the record discussions about uh, perhaps Cromwell at some time joining the health district. Uh, they do have a full time director of health right now, and I believe a part time sanitary and part time secretary. Um, and usually these kinds of issues get raised again at the time that there's a major change in personnel, usually the director of health leaving, retiring, that type of thing. So there's, there's nothing right now and there's nothing that's been more recent, um, but something you know, may come up again for discussion um, you know, when, when we start having a turnover of personnel. Right. Yeah. I know it just seems like as we, as we look at your budgets, Mm -hmm. And having a being efficient about how we provide you know the health services, I'm sure many of the things that we do in our four towns are duplicative over in Cromwell as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, you know we're always looking for regionalization mm -hmm. opportunities in order to help reduce our costs. And sure. that sort of just seems like one that might be a real benefit to the town of Cromwell, who seems to be carrying a lot of the, the same type of personnel that we're carrying. And then, of course, to us, because it helps do things in a more efficient way. So right, and, just, and, and maybe something to think about out reaching out to them to help bear it, carry the burden. Yeah, no, and we are open to those types of inquiries as far as that's concerned. And I think that what you're looking for is probably a more proactive approach to that. Um, it's interesting how towns form and how districts form. And a lot of it has to be is, is more art than science almost. Um, because as Judy said, uh, sometimes it's just the opportunity of somebody leaving that it says, okay, well, let's really reevaluate this um, that causes that to happen. Um, we're always open to the conversation, um, to being able to do it more efficiently and bring in, you know, more revenue so that we can support our towns. Our biggest issue, and, and really as Judy said at the beginning of this, our four towns are very homogenous. Uh, they're very, very like in, in some ways. Um, they do have some differences as far as their demographics changing and things of that nature, but they're very similar in, in, in town. So it makes the approach of the health district really very easy because you don't have that outliers out there where we're in the rural areas where you see mostly septic, where you see a lot of well water and things like that. Most of our towns are very, um, they're very alike. They've got city water, city sewer, and we're able to really address those issues very economically. Two, two other ideas that I was just jotting down that mm -hmm. as you look, as we move on to budgets this year and the following years, is maybe just to look at some type of a private sponsorship. You know, I know that in town or in these group of towns, we've got you know, a tremendous number of pharmacies and so on. And they may be willing to kind of make some type of a coalition to help in our, you know, the health of, our, of the localities. And I'm sure there'll be some good optics for them as well in that. And mm -hmm. also, it, you know, the board sort of runs independently in many respects. So some type of a, since this is a long-term interprogeny kind of a, uh, or interperpetuity kind of a concept, may want to look at some type of an endowment or a foundation. And those concepts have worked well for universities and the long term, real mm -hmm. long term type planning. And I know that even our school board is looking at that type of thing right now. And other towns have started to go down that model to at least be able to possibly take out a chunk of your operating budget as we kind of move forward in time. So just mm -hmm. some thoughts thank for, you for your that. board to consider. Oh, thank you for that. Great. Thank you for your suggestions. Thank you, Mayor. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you for the presentation and for the work that you continue to do for our town. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor.
are no hearings tonight, so our next um, item is the public comment. Uh, I ask that we keep our, you keep your remarks to five minutes. Uh, who would like it? any public comments? Mr. Mazzarella. Uh, good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> First, I'd like to congratulate all of you on your appointments to the newly elected town council. I'm a competitive person by nature, although admittedly had zero experience in running an election race. I listened to advice from those with experience in that sort of contest, thought I did everything that I was supposed to do, and ended up coming in a less than impressive 10th place. I don't think I ever came in 10th place in anything in my entire life. So what are my options? I think I have something to contribute for the, so for the foreseeable future, I'm gonna take up my unofficial seat in the third or fourth row on the left-hand side of the room. I plan to continue to speak at meetings, raising questions and sharing concerns with you that I, <clears throat> have about how our town is run. It will be your choice whether to consider what residents have to say when they're up here speaking at the podium, or you can sit there patiently and wait for the five minute rant period to end. It's your choice, I hope you'll listen. I had some thoughts about the election and read uh, Mark Janey's editorial in this last issue of Weathersfield Life, which pretty much summed up what I was thinking. So I'd like to share a portion of that with you for your consideration. Quote, the council would do well to remember why they were elected. Residents didn't vote for you because they wanted you to engage in partisan politics. They didn't vote for you because they wanted you to stubbornly hold to political ideologies and constantly fight with opposition. They voted for you to run the government and the public schools on their behalf. They expect results, not stalemates. That's not too much to ask. There will be no, there will no doubt be times when you disagree, but don't give up, talk to each other. Even better, listen to each other. Look for ways to achieve a result that offers the best benefit for the most people, even if it isn't exactly what you originally wanted. Let me read that line again. A result that offers the best benefit for the most people. <clears throat> he goes on to say, Politics is supposed to be the art of compromise, not ramming through one's own agenda in the heck with everyone else. It can be best achieved at the local level among a small number of people who are neighbors as well as town officials. I reread each of your responses to questions presented to uh, candidates by Weathersfield Life and uh, how each candidate responded several weeks ago. Pretty much everyone had the same answers and objectives. Focus on economic development and implement shared services. That's great. Everyone wants the same thing. So what does it matter which party's in control? Everyone wants the same thing, right? Well, what will change with this new council in place? Will everyone work towards a common goal? Or will the majority party continue to push through their agenda as was the case last Monday night at the special meeting, which raised our vehicle taxes by seven mils. Another five to four party line vote. Not a lot of collaboration took place last week. Next up will be how the council will deal with another $992,000 cut in state funding. Will there be another special meeting to raise taxes again? Or will you work together to come up with a quote a result that offers the best benefit for the most people. <clears throat> on to tonight's agenda. One comment I'd like to make on item uh, B5A regarding the fracking waste. There's a conflict in the wording between the agenda item page and the proposed ordinance. On the agenda item page, the, the town council item, under justifications it says, 
This ordinance presents, prevents the disposal or use of fracking waste products in the town unless those products have received a beneficial use determination from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. The ordinance as proposed under section 1043 prohibitions says the application for any purpose of natural gas waste or waste whether or not such waste has received beneficial use determination or other approvals by the DEP. Mr. Mazzarelli, your five minutes are up. We look okay. forward to hearing from you at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, he's absolutely right on the conflict between the two. Yeah. The ordinance does say no matter what, the uh, whether it's a beneficial use or not, DEP uh, or whatnot, it is prohibited. So the agenda form had it backwards. So absolutely. Is there any other public comment? Mr. Woodward? Jim Woodworth, 5 River Road, I'm, I'm sorry, 33 Mill Street. How could I forget the way the Mill Street's going these days? But anyhow, um, <clears throat> we, uh, I just wanted to, uh, congratulations to all of you, and thank you for coming out here so often, spending, listening to us talk and so forth. But, um, I, and I really appreciated hearing the uh, health district presentation, and so that kind of follows with the fracking waste ordinance that you've proposed, which uh, is a great thing. Uh, there was a letter in the Hartford Current a month or two ago that said, hey, there's no f fracking going on around here, so you don't have to worry about it, but you just want to stop fracking. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's unfortunate that polluters uh, can make the rules where they, where they do uh, uh, extract and make so much money, they don't have to. The witch's brew that they send into the ground, they don't have to say what it is. They don't test, as I understand it, they don't have, they're not required to test before they inject it. And then the stuff that comes out, uh, and what they inject is, uh, is uh, proprietary, so they don't have to say what they put in it. And then what comes out, holy mackerel, um, <clears throat> even trying to pay attention to what the state might do and how they evaluate it, it's just a crazy thing. So it's great that it says no fracking waste regardless of how it's designated. And uh, I, I hope you do it. And I, I understand there's also some other uh, potential adjustments to the wording that would make it even tighter because loopholes, uh, you want to tighten all the loopholes you can think of. And uh, anyway, thank you for taking this up and uh, perhaps see you in a month or a couple of weeks at the next meeting when the public hearing comes. But very good, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, at the installation of the new town council, I kept an eye open on the website as to is it going to be held on that Monday following the election. I didn't see it on there. I think it's on there now, but it wasn't on there the night of that meeting. So when I came here and I saw a lot of people, and matter of fact, I had a phone call. Was I going? And I says, no, there's no meeting as far as I know. They have a meeting on the 20th and probably that's when they're gonna do it. And then to hear tonight that you voted on the $39 for the auto tax. It's kind of confusing. You didn't have public notice unless you put it out there and only those few people who walked by saw it. But I question whether you followed the normal procedure. That meeting was not, was not, a, was not a private meeting. It was a business meeting for the town and it should have been on the website. It was not. I kept looking for it. And I wasn't coming because it wasn't there. And then to hear that you also voted 
on, on the thirty-nine dollars for the for the auto tax. It just doesn't sound right. It wasn't, and then we don't have the board of education on our website either. And I've sent a message to the manager. I think a month or so ago. I says, "Where is you know? How come it's not?" advertised on our website, and it's not on that calendar either. So I take it that they, they consider themselves a, a different entity, except for when they want money. But I think, it I think the Board of Ed should be advertised, their meetings, on that calendar on the town side of the website. At that installation meeting, I totally agree with Mr. Spinella, where the 70% of our voters were that election day. I don't know what happened to them all, but I know some people that didn't go vote. They just said, I'm not wasting my time. Maybe they all said that. But I do agree with him, and he is correct. And I think going forward, he also mentioned that, you, that the council needs to keep these people in mind, not just the special interests who show up at the meeting. And, I'm, and I show up at a lot of meetings, and I don't get anything. I also agree with Mr. Spinella when he said that Weathersfield needs to concentrate on core government functions. He, re, he, respond, he re, related to police, safety, roads, education, shared services. There's a lot of things that we do that we should not be doing in this town. They're not core. And where we do have some core business going on, there's, there needs to be some changes. Now, there were some other good things that were mentioned, which I don't need to go into, but there was one really disturbing comment made by you, Mayor Bielow, as well as uh, Mary uh, Benton, when you were thanking all your friends, your family members, the Weathersfield Democratic Committee, and then I heard you were also thanking the Weathersfield community for the resistance. I heard that and I'm, I'm appalled that that kind of discussion even comes up at a meeting like this. It doesn't belong here. We all know and we've, we've seen some of this issue. It does not belong here. And if these things are implemented, because the town of Weathersfield supports it, because the mayor supports it, just like Montaneri supported it, I think you people should have legal liability to that, to the rest of us. If we lose funds, if we get hammered for any reason whatsoever, you people should be held liable. And I would hope that this council would take a stand on that. Because Thank you for your comments, Mr. Young. Your five minutes are up. They're up, or do I have another minute to go? Your five minutes are up, according to our timer. Well, let me Here say, let me say, I don't believe the taxpayers should be liable for anything regarding this Weathersfield community for the resistance. Thank I you. I went on and looked at their website. Mr. Young, your time is up. Please, you'll have time at the end of the meeting. Oh, thank you, sir. And I'm going to come back and chat with you, too. I'm sure you will. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Mr. Colantonio? Thank you. He's too tall for me. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Good evening and congratulations. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, and thank you for serving, I guess. I wasn't going to talk tonight, but uh, I was wondering, where did the meeting go? And I have to say that I usually check the calendar and website, and website, and uh, 
that day, or a week or two ago, there was no meetings. This was the only meeting scheduled. That's why I missed it. And I think I missed a lot of action, but that's okay, be it. A few meetings ago, uh, right after there was an accident on Morrison Avenue, I questioned a few things here and there, and I also questioned the sight distance, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I also questioned basically some hedges that go over the sidewalk and orchard. And the town manager told me that everything was taken care of it. I go by there every day. Coming out of that driveway on the corner of uh, Silas Dean and, uh, and Morrison Avenue, there is an evergreen. And because of the screwed up edge of payment on Morrison Avenue that was a result of this, the town, I guess, uh, it's hard to see. And like I said before, and I'm gonna say it again, the only identity that it should have been penalized was the town. And yet somebody else coming out of the driveway got ticketed for whatever reason. Only one, even though the accident happened only about 125 feet away from Silas Dean, how fast was that guy going? Unbelievable, you know, it's, this is just crazy. And when is it gonna get done? I mean, you know, it's, it's a problem. Are we gonna wait for another accident? I've been living there since 1973, and that was the only accident that I can remember. And it was not done before the reconstruction of, of Morrison Avenue it was done after. So something went wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Yes, in the back. Good evening. My name is Mary Dobrook. I live at 689 Follybrook Boulevard. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a cold. I'm here tonight for several reasons. First, to congratulate each of you on your election or re-election to the council. I appreciate how much time the council work will cause you to be away from your family all in your attempt to help make our town be the best town it can be. Second, I'm here to say thank you. I'd like to thank town government, town staff, school staff, police, fire, and all the organizations in town that have been so very wonderful. We moved to Wethersfield one month before our now 33-year-old was born. All three of our girls went to Corpus Christi or Emerson Williams, Silas Dean Middle School, and the high school. With their excellent teachers and the excellent curriculum that is offered in all of our schools, all three of our children were prepared for the further schooling and for their current careers. Parks and Rec taught them how to swim. Barracudas taught them how to compete. All throughout their lives, going to the library was something that we did as a family and as they did all through high school. The George D. Ritchie League taught them how to play soccer. Between the three of them, they played basketball, soccer, tennis, field hockey, volleyball, ran track, and swam. Prior to high school, it was volunteers all over this town that taught them how to play these sports. The town always looks beautiful. Care is taken to keep the streets neat, keep our sidewalks clean. Our parks and fields are kept in the best condition that they can be and people want to play in our town. We always knew if we needed the fire or police, all we had to do was call 911 and within minutes, they would be there. 
if we had a family issue, everybody in town knows you can call Family Sur Department of Family and Youth Services and get help there. Our seniors in town, some of them are having trouble making ends meet and finding enough money to be able to feed themselves and pay for their medicines and their rent. And yet the town is there for them as well. All these things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen because town council members do the work that we in the town would like to have done. And that is make our town the best town it can be against many odds, against many state reductions. But at the end of the day, you create and lay the groundwork for the town employees to have the kind of town we all want our children to grow up in. So thank you to those who lay out the groundwork. And more importantly, thanks to all those who actually work for the town and make it happen for us. I wanted to say thank you because we sold our house and we're gonna to move to Rocky Hill. Which brings me to the third reason why I'm here. Dennis and I looked for a 55 and older place that had two car garage, a standalone unit, and a basement. Weathersfield doesn't have that. There are a lot of people like me that are out there. And this may be one of the next big challenges that you're going to be faced with, that people like me are going to have to pack up and move elsewhere, because what we want is not here. So I encourage the council to keep this type of community development in mind. I guarantee that we aren't the only people that want this, and that this will come up in the future. And I know that we are landlocked and limited as to what's available here. But if there are opportunities, I encourage you to embrace them. I'm going to miss this town enormously. I'm going to miss Village Pizza. <laughs> I'm going to miss Rite Aid that used to be Silestine Drugs and Pelton's. We're going to miss the jogging track. We're going to miss the running trails. We're going to miss the Memorial Day Parade. We're going to miss the town green. We'll be missing a lot watching town council, board of eds, and planning and zoning meetings because, believe it or not, it's one of our highlights of our weeks. <laughs> <laughs> My saving grace is that I still work in town and that we are only one town over. Somehow it's different though when you actually don't live in that same town. Thank you. Thank so again, you. thank you. Thank you to town and thank you to town staff. Thank you, Mary. Are there any other comments? If not, we'll declare the public comment closed. We move on to council reports. Are there any council members that have reports? Councilor Hurley. Thank you. Um, I attended the rec board meeting on Thursday, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying his name. Jim Warworth came down, and I'll summarize kind of what he said. He talked a little bit about the cove, but basically he's trying to get an effort to kind of try to keep the, the cove a beautiful place for people to visit, and the board's going to uh, revisit the cove master plan and see what they can do to kind of keep things going down there to keep the trash out, keep the brush down. Um, also, then there was a discussion about homeowners that have put up docks and other structures on town property um, on or near the Weathersfield Reservoir, and the town manager is currently looking into that matter. Other council members? Deputy Mayor? Uh, I, I attended the EDIC meeting last week, and just some dates for all the councilors to keep in mind. Uh, December 13th is the Salute to Business at the Weathersfield Country Club. January 18th is the State of the Town Breakfast at the Keeney Center. Uh, Peter announced to us that the winners of the photos contest for the calendar have been uh, finalized and uh, 
They will be honored at the uh, Salute to Business Night. Uh, we were told that 287 Church Street was sold, which is the old Leclerc's building. And somebody's looking at two empty lots over by Executive Square. And the individual that was building the uh, gas station up at 881 Berlin Turnpike is looking for a new gas vendor to go in there with them. Uh, the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee also met last week. And they're working on their spring program. It's going to be a night program this time to have information for people uh, thinking of retiring and who are retiring on what to think about and what to do for the future. So uh, there'll be more information on that in the future. Thank you. Any other council reports? If not, we'll move to council comments. Any council comments? Councilor Rell? I had the opportunity today to go to a conference for the uh, Connecticut Recreation and Parks Association, and I'm happy to report that Weathersfield was well represented. Uh, Kathy Bagley is the uh, co-chair of the Professional Development Committee down there. Uh, she did an outstanding job and was recognized by the uh, uh, leadership team of the Connecticut Parks and, or Recreation and Parks Association. As well, um, Sal Cuccia was down there um, as well. So. Um, two people from Connecticut or from Weathersfield were recognized uh, for their work on uh, our Parks and Rec, and uh, I think they're doing an outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lesser. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Mayor Bellow. I uh, just wanted to commend the town uh, youth and social services staff. I had the opportunity with my wife and two of my girls to come down here on Saturday and help out with the preparation for the Thanksgiving meals for our families in town. And Kathy Bagley, Erica Deshera, and the entire uh, youth and uh, social services staff did an amazing job along with countless volunteers. And just so you all know, they're making it possible for 134 Weathersfield families to have food and a, a nice Thanksgiving on Thursday. And uh, another th important thing to note, that is an increase over what they served last year. So the needs are, are growing. About 134 Weathersfield families and really got to hand it to Kathy, Erica, and the entire uh, Youth and Social Services Department for the work they do. Thank you. Learning. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to see Sally's here tonight. Uh, I've got some questions for both her and uh, the manager. I started getting calls this weekend from people. This is uh, an unusual year in that we had a mild fall and as a result of that our leaves are not falling and I've gotten a call from a lot of people up especially in Timber Village area uh, their second pickup is coming up now and half the leaves aren't off the trees yet and I, you know, I realize we normally just do two pickups and some of them are seniors up in that area and make it hard for them to uh, bag them and bring them to the transfer station if we have a mild winter is there any way we can do anything because I would think we're going a little ahead of schedule if the leaves aren't down yet we're, help any of those people we're actually just about on schedule we were a day behind um, we can't guarantee a third pass and again it all comes down to dollars right it costs money to keep the seasonals on it costs money to keep the trucks rolling and once it gets to snow we're going to convert those trucks to snow plows <coughs> so whatever stays on the snow shelf is going to be buried under snow I'm just saying, but if we have, you know, if the winter holds off for a while, is there anything we can do? Maybe just with staff and not with seasonals. We could look into that. If you're going to want a third pass, I think the council ought to direct us to do a third pass so we can get the information out there. Because if we do a third pass in one neighborhood and not the entire town, we'll hear about it. So if we're going to do a third pass, now's the time to make that decision. We get it published, come up with a map in a, in a, schedule and hope the weather holds off but the minute we declare that third pass it's going to snow <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one Jeff. I like that. And what is the um, cost for third pass uh, it's several thousand dollars fuel time and again once it looks like it's going to snow we're going to pull those trucks off the road and convert them to plows with no expectation of ever getting back into the leaves The leaves can be brought to the transfer station without cost. But if the council wants a third pass, tell us now. 
it doesn't take up the number of weeks to do a pass through town. So once we start doing the third pass, as the town manager is saying, we can't do one and not another part of town. So it is quite a commitment to make that third pass, understanding like this morning there were places that had snow. And it does, as the town manager alluded to, the cost of fuel, the cost of manpower, um, and I say manpower, not women with car, because we don't have any women working for us right now on the cruise, um, and the overtime, the time costs um, do play a very large part in that decision. And without the seasonals, it's just going to take longer. Yes. How many thousands of dollars? Would you come up, Sally? I'd have to run numbers on it. It's fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. You do an overtime. You're working Saturdays. That's all, sir. <clears throat> Mayor Bill, has the second pass started, Jim? Yes, in some areas, the second pass has started, and over. This year, the leaves just hung on. Some years are down, some years are not. We adjust the list each year so the first people aren't first every year. I mean, there's a science to this. It's not just a collection. In the schedule that has been um, advertised, we are currently um, in where we're supposed to be right now for the week of November 20th, which means that it was section six, seven, and then one. We were in seven today. And so we are on schedule of the schedule that we have advertised. We still have another um, few sections to get through by December 1st, which was the date that we said that we would be ending the program. We certainly do understand that the weather has not cooperated with the leaves coming down, but um, you know we're doing the best that we can and going through and picking up whatever we can that people that people put out. As town manager said, people can bring their leaves to the transfer station um, at no cost to them. Um, we've also found, and, and so we certainly do understand the, the difficult nature of mother nature. Um, but as we said, we do a six week program to sandwich it in between pretty much the end of the beginning of the fall and what is normally the beginning of the snow season. Because once again, we utilize those trucks for everything. It's not as if we have um, specific snow trucks versus leaf trucks, because to transform a truck to make it be usable for snow we're taking the leaf boxes off we're taking putting the plows on we're loading them with salt and so it is a quite it is a process to switch you can't just do it on the fly and say we're going to pick up leaves in the morning and oh it snowed at night so let's go plow snow there is quite a process that takes place to transform the trucks from leaf pickup to snow pickup how long does that take it can take a good hour, if not more, um, because you're talking the, the boxes are, they're metal boxes. Those are, those are quite heavy. You're taking them out. You have to clean the truck before you can put salt in the truck. You need to put the plows on. And so it, we're, it, is, it is a process, and it takes multiple people to do in order to do it safely. Per truck? Per truck, yes. <coughs> yes. Um, I, I think the deputy brings up a good uh, point. I'm not sure if we're ready, going to be ready to legislate on that right now without a little bit more information and data. And I think the staff would probably have to, probably couldn't do that on the fly right here. Right. Um, so, um, you know, while it's certainly a thought, thoughtful and a concern of the residents, if the leadership of the council, you know, thinks that we need to have a special meeting to, for special circumstances like this, then I think that I'd certainly be able to call, uh, be able to make the call if, if that's something that we want to do with a little bit more information though. I mean, I don't think it's something that's gonna happen necessarily right here, right now with the amount of information that we have in front of us. Those are just some thoughts on the leaves. <laughs> but it's well said by the deputy and a concern of the residents, so. Mm -hmm. Do 
Any other counselors want to weigh in? Just, I wasn't around on the council, but I definitely remember the October snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, director of fiscal services at that point? You had just begun? No, I was actually, I wasn't here for that. Okay. Um, but I heard quite a lot about right. the difficulties of snow on top of leaves. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we may face that mm -hmm. anyways, um, but I think uh, um, Jeff brings up a pretty good point. We do offer uh, a transfer station yes, for, do. for those who have not been able to get the majority, well, I guess the majority of the leaves are down, having driven through the neighborhood and heard comments from the public as well. Um, but I did drive through, and it does look like most of them have come down in the past couple of days with the, the rain and the wind. Mm -hmm. and the second pass is going through. Mm -hmm. The public is offered the option to go to the transfer station as well. Yes, and the transfer station is open on Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays for people's convenience. Early. Um, I, yeah, I don't think we probably need a special meeting for this. Probably Sally and Jeff can probably figure this out for us. Well, I'd like no. some direction from the council if he wants to spend money on a third pass. Yeah, I mean, you need authorization for the spend. That's not. I mean, we went through a budget process and we got mm -hmm. squeezed, and yes. we said there'll be two passes, and, and we're going to squeeze them. Mm -hmm. That's what you. I mean, I have no com no. If you want it, you want it. Right. I'm a, we'll get it done. I mean, I got this at the beginning of the week, and we have had some windy weather since. Mm -hmm. Maybe we go out and we, we've take heard a look the same at the thing. Right. I mean, we've heard from I've probably gotten a dozen phone calls in my office. Mm -hmm. I'm, I know Sally has gotten a few. This is just a, a poor year mm -hmm. for leaves. Right. But we would be happy to continue the program to right. that's the will of the council. And also, Jeff had mentioned um, having the temporary staff. The other thing that we are fighting against is daylight. And so we would need to keep those extra staff members on to, to be able to get out as many crews as we can during the, late, the daylight hours because we really cannot operate once dusk comes. It's just too dangerous to do. So in order to be able to do a third pass through town, we would need to keep those additional workers on. Um, following the trucks and, and getting the leaves where they can get sucked up. But again, it's number, another factor is the number of daylight hours that we have uh, in order to do this operation. So Sally, the, um, the second pass will be finished on December 1st. Um, How long yes. would it take for a third pass to be completed? Are you talking two weeks, three weeks? Uh, at this point, I'd rather have, speak with my highway supervisor who understands how many crews we have out there now and, and how many people, but it does take, it would, it would take us, I would say, between a week and a week and a half to two weeks to do, most likely, because we're going, going through the entire town where normally we go through sections of town. And so I would provide the town manager with that information. And the sooner we get the word out, Oh, absolutely. The better because yes. we're going to pass houses that didn't know and we're going to come back. Right. And we also have a lot of people who um, use landscapers to gather their leaves and we're always battling that because they put them in the street um, and to try to allow people to make those arrangements with their landscapers to come if they know we're doing another pass. What I'll do is uh, tomorrow I'll take some time riding around the town and see exactly what's left on the trees after the weekend we had mm -hmm. and concur with the mayor to see if, you know, we should look at doing right. something. Because it was a windy week and a lot came right. down, but uh, let's see what's left first and then we'll concur. My, my trees in my backyard right. are still full. And the transfer station will yeah. be open this Friday and Saturday after Thanksgiving um, for people if they are out, want to work off Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> Um, we will be open on Friday and Saturday. If we're going to take the time, can we get a dollar figure on it? How much it's going to cost for a third? Sure. Can we work on that? Mm -hmm. And Sally, could you explain the process of bringing the leaves to the transfer station? Do All they have to be bagged? <clears throat> Excuse me, are they bagged or? 
We'll, we'll take them in any way people bring them. Um, if they want to bring them in the paper bags, we can, we can get those. If they want to bring them in, we've had people who come in just the back of a truck with leaves, and we have receptacles for them to put them in. And so we try to make it as easy as possible for people to bring it. And um, so as long as people come with it, we'll figure out a way to help, to help and empty it. Thank you. There's another option if the people have to bring them down. I know the station's only a couple of days a week. If there's still a lot left at the end that people have to bring down, could we work it where somebody could let them in on the days that it's closed down if we had to? Yeah, just because of the scenario? That would be difficult to do. We would need to keep the, the transfer station attendant on for that day. There's really no way um, for someone to just run out and open it up. We can look at that. We more could look. Hours, yeah, we could look, certainly okay. look to do that. Okay. So if we get a number, are we coming back together? Because if there's an expectation or a possibility, you, you all are going to want a third pass. Mm -hmm. We're going to start in the morning planning. We, right. If you don't do it, you don't do it. But if you do do it, at least we have a plan. Right. And as a town manager, then we would need to advertise that because there are people would need to know. Well, if we're going to talk about it, we'd have to put it on the agenda and, and work through it. I mean, right now this is counselor comments, right? Yeah. And if that's what you guys want to do, then that's fine. But I'll take the direction from the leadership. I mean, I'll take a run, run around town tomorrow, take a look and see where things are, and I'll, con you, you know, I'll converse with the mayor to see which direction we should go in. And, uh, wouldn't hurt to make you know come up with some numbers of what it would cost in the meantime. Okay. Are there any other council comments? Yeah, Councilor another question. Early. Another question for Jeff. Sure. This should be easier question. So we got the 992k cut from the governor. Um, I also saw about 170 million from this a projected state deficit. Mm -hmm. Has that come up? No. The no. Uh, cut that happened last Friday was a result of the uh, legislature including within the budget roughly $180 million worth of discretionary cuts for the governor. And part of those were cuts to municipal aid, most primarily ECS. So there is still a $178 million hole in the state budget that will have to be addressed at some point. Yeah, thank you. I think that 178 has grown to 202 million as of today, which has triggered the 1% automatic rescission authority of the governor. So they are going to be going into session uh, to deal with that uh, deficit. Imagine so. The 178 was below the 1% trigger. So going over 187 million was the automatic trigger to mm -hmm. institute the deficit mitigation plan. I don't think the budget is anywhere close to being over. Any other comments? Going to town manager's report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just an update, Standish House, the painting. We're gonna do three sides, um, the north side and the back and the front. Stop for the season because the weather has gotten unseasonably cold early. Um, but we'll continue to work through the winter. One, in, one item in particular, one of the front windows, the window sill that needs to be replaced is actually one piece that extends through the window inside and outside. So while uh, Lucas is closed in January for those two weeks, we'll have the contractor back out. He'll dismantle the window, take it out, and put the new window sill in and prime it so we can come back in spring and finish. And then the final side, the patio side, will be done in the spring. Um, Stillman started today, the roof. So we anticipate that to be moving pretty quickly. The scaffolding's up. The Board of Ed has been channeling people to the to the designated walkways, so that we anticipate getting done pretty soon, or not, 
too bad unless it snows, but then they'll walk through it anyway. Um, and we've had discussion about a council tour. I'm looking at December 15th, it's a Friday. This will take at least five hours, so we'll plan accordingly. We're gonna start in the morning and work our way through um, the big four, which is town hall, PD, physical services, and the community center. And along the way, we'll uh, visit, not stop in and visit, but at least identify other town-owned features in, in the town. On your podium this evening is a list of town-owned structures that does not include open space. Uh, we're working on getting you a map that shows all, all those things. So that's what I have. Thank you. Dolores, do you have anything? I got a call from W um, NPR for uh, how many people voted for Kevin. <laughs> and how now many people an did question. vote for Kevin? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, everybody didn't record it on their on certain sheets, so I guess after 16 days we can open up and look at actual ballots to see if people, uh, how many people did. But we have, we approximately know we have out of 65 or so. Okay, thank you. Just, <laughs> That's great. just a quick the question <laughs> about the, that vote. So if 65 people voted for Kevin the turkey, you cannot vote for a write-in candidate and six council candidates, correct? Well, he's not really a candidate, so we would never count him as a write-in. Like if somebody wrote Michael Rell right, and hadn't voted for you up, up top, that would get a, that would get a vote. Uh, but what it does is it knocks everything off and puts it into the side pocket of the vote, and so it has to be done at hand a hand count. So one of they did find one ballot that had uh, 12 votes for Kevin on the right in line, and nobody else on the ballot got checked off. Can you can one elector vote for any six candidates and a write in candidate? No, because then it's an overvote. But we don't count Kevin because he's not a, a technical uh, write-in. We didn't. The state, Secretary of State did not declare any write-in votes for our that's, town. Thank you. <laughs> if that's all, we'll move into council action. We have one um, resignation. I make a motion to approve the resignation. Of Ken Lesser from the Economic Development and Improvement Commission and the Youth Advisory Board. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, any comments? He's still, he's still All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstains? Okay, the motion passes. Uh, we don't have any appointments to boards or commissions tonight. We don't have any unfinished, unfinished business coming off the table, so we'll move to item B3A. May I have a motion? Motion to accept the energy efficiency incentive from Eversource for project number CT17-104-6377, Wethersfield High School renovation project. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Town manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, at the end of all these building projects, there's normally a process whereby CLMP or Eversource in this situation provides incentives based upon the energy efficiency of the building. Um, $112,000 from Eversource. We anticipate another uh, similar amount perhaps from Connecticut Natural Gas, but we've not seen that yet. The work is done uh, in order to get the check. The CES, the design engineer, We'll have to certify that it's met the basis of design and then uh, submit that to Eversource and that will complete the process. Thank you. Are there any council comments or questions? Councilor Forrest? Thanks. Uh, Jeff, does, uh, 
Does this mean that, if with acceptance of this particular package, this is also the, what am I called, the implementer? So we accept the money, but then we also designate its implementation to, I think it was the burner, or burner That's really? the next item on the agenda. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Seeing none, have a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. The next item is B3B. Do I have a motion? Yes. Um, motion to approve the agreement between the Connecticut Light and Power Company doing business as Eversource Energy in the town of Wethersfield for an energy efficient fund grant. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Town Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor Council. Um, Eversource runs a couple different programs. For energy efficiencies, uh, Weathersfield has earned um, twenty thousand dollars in different grants through these programs. Um, this agreement allows us to access those dollars, and we have used these to upgrade facilities at the town that we wouldn't ordinarily have money for. So we are proposing to use this twenty thousand dollars to replace the oil burner or the oil boiler at the Solomon Wells house with a high efficiency natural gas. Uh, Thank you. Are there any council comments or questions? Councillor Forrest. I guess I can, well, I can talk about it now. We're, we're good. Yep. <laughs> um, the uh, I was looking at it for the allocation was about nineteen thousand for the burner. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? Good now, furnace, yeah. just from our previous workings with solar, is this one of those programs where you're required to use one of their contractors and bring them in, and it's kind of no. So um, the the twenty thousand for the is um, is that are we going to bring in like a third party to kind of do all that work or are we doing that in house or we uh, submitted three we got three quotes for the work it's under twenty thousand dollars so it doesn't require a formal bid process but we have a selected vendor uh, right we we went out uh, as town manager said we had three bids we did select a vendor who works on this type of equipment um, while the town staff will not be doing the work we will be there we will be assisting and also understand how it was or how it would be installed so that when the time comes that we would need to do maintenance on it we would be fully uh, have full knowledge of it from its inception so is it my understanding that we don't have the staff to install a furnace of this kind for the Salma Walls house correct because of its un uniqueness it's a combination of the uniqueness. It does take multiple people in order to do it. These are companies that are very proficient in doing it. They can certify it. Um, warranty. Uh, warranty, commission it, make sure that it is running properly, work with our staff to educate our staff on, on how to use this machine. Um, the boilers now, we would be uh, purchasing a boiler which is almost 96% efficient whereas the one we're currently operating is about 74% efficient. Sure. So these are highly technical machines also, and so these are companies that work with these every day, and so they're very proficient in knowing how to, to do the installation and then also to train our staff in order to be able to use it. So I guess some of the things I'm looking at, and you know, I mean, Solomon Moss House is about the size of a lot of houses around here, and looking at a $20,000 burner, and maybe you can walk me off of the ledge admittedly that just mm -hmm. seemed kind of pricey for that kind of work but is there does that does that strike you as sort of pricey too even though we got the three bids and you know the rest of it and for, a, for this us? this type of equipment is exceptionally expensive and, and even if you were to do a residential home i know um from people who i've been talking to in in everything from small condos it could be almost ten thousand dollars and so this type yeah. of equipment but we once again we with this particular um, operation it is it is part of the grant we competitively bid it so that we would make sure we were in the realm and that is what we got from from um, all of the vendors it is the price of these this type of equipment nowadays and there is no inexpensive way of doing something if you want the quality and you want to be able to get a certain amount of years out of your product and so that's also part of the the bid process to make sure that every that everyone was bidding on the same specifications right so now is it my understanding that this because it's part of this clean energy grant that has to be used for let's say like a certain uh, level of efficiency and, and this type of equipment is 
what's mm -hmm. required by this type of grant, you know, this yes. high level efficiency, yes. which the beg, begs the case right. for the high price. The right. program sponsor signed off on the install. Right. Right. Whatever Plus the they are. Rating, I think right. it is and they are in the company, it, they are um, going to be installing the gas line. And so it allows us to stop using oil and right. to use the cleaner burning natural gas and to then upgrade the equipment, which the current uh, system that we're doing is over 12 years old and has had issues with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great opportunity for us to A, be able to get natural gas, B, to change out a piece of equipment that would need to be changed out anyway at no, pretty much no cost to us and be able to get a unit which is highly efficient and clean burn and clean operating. And you feel on the increase of efficiency, like it, on average we spend 5,000 a year there and now we're looking at 2,500, is that? Well, we'd we be going from a 74% efficient of oil to 96% efficient on natural gas. Natural gas always runs us it, less expensive to run, cleaner right. to run, better to maintain. I didn't know if you had a feel for the number. The, the, Not the, off the top of my head, no. I don't. Okay. We don't have natural gas prices for next year yet. Right. Okay. Thanks. Deputy Mayor. Uh, how, how old is the current furnace? Uh, so. It's over 12 years old. Okay. So it's nothing where we have to worry about when they go in to do it that there's going to be any asbestos or anything that they no. have to get rid of? No. Okay. There's always asbestos. <laughs> not that not we know of. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no I know some of the old type ones were all wrapped in it. That's the only reason right. I'm asking. No. Any other questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstain abstentions? Just one more comment. Thank you. Sure. We, we have done installs in some of the buildings on our own. We did a firehouse. I think we did one of the firehouses mm -hmm. for both the air conditioner and the mm -hmm. furnace. So mm -hmm. we do look at scope and scale. Right. Depending on what right. in the time of year right now. We have one HVAC person and that person is running around on heat calls. <laughs> Appreciate the comments, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is B3C. May I have a motion? Uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> My first time with this. Motion? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I move to approve the uh, pull attachment agreement with the Southern New England Telephone Company also known as Frontier Communications, in the Weathersfield Police Department. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Ken. The Chief's here tonight to answer any questions. This is uh, very similar to an agreement the prior council passed with, uh, who was it, Eversource, Chief? Yeah. Uh, which would allow the fixed um, license plate readers on the Silas Dean Highway in the or on the turnpike. Thank you. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. Uh, it's it's the same thing. And the problem is the poles, as we found out in April, were co-owned, Eversource and Frontier. So I had to get the same MOA from Frontier that I had to get from Eversource. And it took since April to get them to finally put forward this MOA. We haggled back and forth for, what, eight months. This is the project from heck. <laughs> it seems like it's never ending. I'm gonna find out now a third person owns that pole too, so I, I hope not. We may be buying some of them, so you better hurry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, are there any council questions? Okay, seeing none, may, um have a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have no bids tonight. Um, we have an ordinance for introduction. You want to? Do you want to pull that and send it to a committee? I, yes, I, so we do. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, okay. I'll make a motion to uh, move it to the Public Works Committee for review for language as described. Do have a second? Second. Second. Deputy Mayor, second. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Is there any discussion on that, or should we just move it? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstains? Um, just oh. may I ask a question? We're moving item B five A. Is that what it is? Yes. yes. To the which committee? I made a motion for the Public Works Committee. Public Works Committee. And okay. infrastructure. Aye. <laughs> I had not voted. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear, we're unanimously approving that motion to move to a committee. Thank you. And who is the second, please? Dep the Deputy oh, Mayor Weiss. It's a pickle. Thank you. <laughs> Close call. Okay, we have the minutes of October 16th. I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of October 16, 2017. Thank Se you. Second. Thank you. Are there any additions or deletions or changes? Uh, one correction, uh, Dolores, on page three, where I talked about 24 uh, Maple Street, the name of the firm was restaurantsupply.com, not Rosset Supply. Okay, thank you. The bottom of the page. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Do the, does the council that was sworn in last Monday, can they vote on minutes approve or approved minutes of a prior council? Dolores? Uh, the people who are present today as long as we have five from their previous committee. We do. So the new council have. members can vote. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. No opposed, no abstentions. And we move on to public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak? Mr. Mazzarella, come on up. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. I'd like to pick up where I left off, talking about item B5A. I was discussing a discrepancy in uh, the wording on the proposed ordinance. My concern is that if a uh, material such as road salt or brine has received a beneficial use determination from the state of Connecticut, the town under the wording in the proposed ordinance will be unable to take advantage of a potential cost savings material. And this wording might also preclude uh, <clears throat> a source of supply for certain products that the town may need to maintain roads. In closing, I'd like to share a few observations. On election day, I spent about 12 hours at various polling places. During the day, I found a few things missing. The first item, voters. Approximately 67% of the registered town voters failed to even show up. We as a town should do better. Second item, voters were encouraged to bring food items to the polls to support our Wethersfield Food Bank. I myself left the house early in the morning empty-handed. <clears throat> we as a town should do better. For those that can afford it, stop by the town hall and donate to the food bank. There are plenty of residents that are just managing to get by in our town. Even modest increases in taxes cause a huge strain on some of these people's already tight budgets. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Colantonio? Good evening again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I, when I left the house tonight, I said, I'm not gonna speak at all because, you know, go and give them, especially the new ones, a break. That's what I told my wife, but I guess as you listen and, you know, things come to mind, but uh, I've heard over tonight that basically there's a problem collecting these leaves. 
Why? Because uh, I guess uh, fall has been milder than usual. But yet we're basically unscheduled collecting these leaves. So if the fall has been so mild, why didn't we start a little bit later? Or why did we start on time? And if we start on time, did they really collect all the leaves? I mean, I, I just don't see two and two right here. Obviously, if, if the leaves took a longer time to fall down, what did these people do the first few days? I don't know. For me, uh, twice a year, it's good. I, I never put leaves in front of the house. I, I recycle them, and uh, probably more people should, should do that. It's, it's really good for the garden, you know? Uh, I mean, I find it interesting. I find it uh, enjoyable, and, uh, and I exercise. And what I forgot the last time I was here now to talk is, is I've been talking right here about the stop sign on Morrison Avenue for many years, and I'm not going to go away. And yet, over these years, I never saw the town engineer making a comment. There is a lot of information out there. I said them and numerous times that basically, uh, Tickton and Morrison Avenue, it's not safe. People go 31 miles per hour, the 85th percentile. It's, it's, it's uh, posted for 25, and that intersection, it's not safe. Intersection side distance doesn't meet the 31 miles per hour. I would like the town engineer, which is a PE, because I heard many things from you guys, and I don't believe them all, but I would like the town engineer to give his own opinion. He has a PE, and I sure hope he has the responsibility to express his opinion, because that intersection does not meet the standard. And by the way, for you new guys, uh, Next meeting, I'm going to go over again the things I've been saying for a few years, so everybody will be on the same page. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I was looking at the, um, at the year ending June 30th, 2011, uh, Bloom Shapiro audit report. And in there, I noticed a category called non-town cash account using the town's federal identification number. What it says is during our audit, we noted that cash accounts within the agency funds were opened using town federal identification number. All cash accounts opened in the town's name using town federal identification number should be used only for the purpose of conducting town business and should have a town employee as a sig signature. Recommendation, we recommend the town the town's federal identification number be removed from accounts that are not town business. And a town employee should be added as a signature for those that are for town business. I, I, I noticed this some time ago and I never brought it forward, but it appears other people are using the town, town's federal identification number. And it appears that as we go into the next years of reports, 2013, year ending June 30th, 2013. The other one I just read was 2011. This is now 13. Same thing. You have in there, non-town cash account using the town's federal identification number. So your auditors are complaining that this is a violation in 2011, 2013. Then in 2016,
the header again. Non-town cash account using the town's federal identification number. I don't have 14, 2014 or 15 here, but I'm sure it's in there too. And I'm bringing this forward to you folks. This has been going on for a long time. And this one says, the town is still working on removing the remaining accounts that are not town accounts from the town's federal identification number. I hope to see that disappear. But the fact remains, it took how many years to get even to where the town started to do anything about it? It's like using somebody's social security number. It's like using somebody's number to go buy something and be tax exempt. To go buy something and get the town's discount. And the question comes up, who are these people? Anybody know? I'll send you an FOI tomorrow. I'd like to know who these people are. Secondly, as I go back to my little list, 2013, as of June 30th, 2013, there's a category called Fraud and Risk Assessment. If the mayor would be kind enough to let me read this whole thing, I'll read it. But otherwise, you can go ask the town manager. He can provide that to you. But it talks about, it says, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, just a couple little blurs. It is estimated that U.S. businesses, including municipalities, lose up to 7% of their actual revenue to fraud. Municipalities are especially vulnerable due to the large amount of cash collected in the tax collector's office, in addition to decentralized collection points such as transfer stations, golf courses, recreation programs, etc. And it just goes on. It says during the annual audit, we obtain <coughs> an understanding that the town's internal controls and access the risk of fraud and whether or not the financial statements would be materially misstated due to these risks. However, an audit is designed to provide reasonable, but not absolute, assurance. And then it goes on. As I move up to the year 2015, it's in there. And I don't have to read that. As we move up to the year 2000, as of the year 2016, listen, this is important information. I understand you know, that. If, if you want five minutes, and I've come here with a lot of information I understand that, that, has, we would that is be, very valuable to you folks, and you, you refuse happy, to go anywhere with it. We would be happy to receive that, sir, but your five minutes are you right have it. now. You have it already. I don't have to give you anything. The okay, problem you, is, from all these years going back, these issues have not been resolved. You have serious financial problems. Actions I've done. complained about them before. And you're in charge, Mr. Town Manager. Okay, you're Mr. in charge. Young, thank you for your And you comments. should be taking care of it. Obviously, you're not. You'd rather sit here and say, Mr. Citizen, your five minutes are up. Go home. I'll go home. Do but we? Do we have a motion the thing to is, adjourn? The thing is, you have serious adjourn. problems. Second. What's that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Goodbye. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.